and we have to really escalate the noise we make so that we'll be heard. Welcome to Gay USA. I'm Andy Hum. And I am Chris Cooper, filling in for Ann Northrup. Great to see you, Chris. Thanks for being here. And Glad we have a lot of news. And uh, we're going to start with the fact that the the new Congress, the United States Congress, is more LGB than ever. Meanwhile, um, we're going to play What's My Lie today <laughs> with uh, the lone gay Republican in the House, um, George Santos. Yeah. Uh, we're going to talk about a lot of mixed verdicts on whether groups claiming to be religious can discriminate against LGBTQ people. Meanwhile, gay financier and philanthropist Scott Minard has died. Um, the British conservative government is blocking Scotland's bill to make it easier to change one's gender, an unprecedented challenge to Scotland's home rule. Meanwhile, breakthroughs uh, for LGBTQ rights have happened in the Netherlands and, of all places, in Poland. And a broader decision that we just heard about today from the European Court, uh, Court of Human Rights. Uh, that murder of a young gay leader in Kenya uh, turns out to be domestic violence. Um, there was a gay host and gay honoree at the troubled Golden Globe Awards returning for the first time after a, hi a hiatus. And we're going to save a lot of time at the end of the show because uh, Chris Cooper, and this is news, Ooh. is going to tell us about his new book, Better Living Through Birding, his upcoming TV series on National Geographic and Disney Plus, and reviews of four new gay films and a TV series. Oh my goodness, that's so, a lot. But we start with the let's start. Well, let's start with the George Santos show and get that out of the way. He, this is the gay person making the most news in the United States these days. Yeah, he's sort of the gayish guy who is alternatively named George Santos. Um, I'm sure Andy is a, as embarrassed as I am that he is representing Long Island, where both of us grew up. Right. Um, the latest uh, bits of news are he hates puppies. He apparently um, stole the money, $3,000, um, that was set aside to help a disabled veteran um, get surgery for his dog so the dog could survive. He did a GoFundMe under the name of uh, Anthony DeVolder and uh, ran off with the money, and the dog died. Right, and we're going to get to that, his, his mix-up on his names. And by the way, I think people who uh, can forgive all kinds of political corruption cannot forgive the mistreating of pets. Yeah, but, you know, that's why I thought it was important to lead with the dead dog. Um, but yeah, the lies have just been sort of cascading. But, he, he led a, a Stop the Seal steel rally while wearing a stolen scarf that he allegedly stole from his roommates. Um, you know, his resume has been exposed as an exercise in fiction. Um, we already knew how much fiction there was, but now it's on his resume going all the way back to 2020, which he submitted to the Republicans. Some of them knew what was going on. But and some Republicans are standing up to him. And the, the, the ones on Long Island who are, there they are. These are, these are all Long Island and Queens Republicans from that district and others uh, from the New York party. Uh, that 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 they are they are totally embarrassed for him. They want him to resign. He's a, they said he's a stain on the House of Representatives, um, and uh, one of the recently elected ones, uh, Long Island's Anthony Esposito, joined the call for his resignation. The Nassau County Executive, four Republican members of Congress, but not that uh, Stefanik woman upstate who was in the GOP leadership. Well, and that's the thing, Andy, is that the local politicians, the local Republicans are calling for his resignation, but the national politicians and the national leadership in Congress are beholden to him because he's part of their slim majority that backed Kevin McCarthy during that whole struggle we saw like a week or two ago. So, you know, and that is sort of symptomatic of the whole problem. And that's why I think it's so important to put George Santos as amusing and entertaining and ridiculous as this has been to put it in context, which is that he is not an aberration. He is the ultimate example of what the post-Trump Republican Party has turned into. Say anything, lie, 
up the wazoo, repeat the line often enough, do whatever it takes to win. And, and then you won't get any consequences because there will be enough enablers around you who will just sit back and let it happen because they want to keep winning too. And that's sort of what the Republican Party, which even though you and I may not have agreed with a lot of their policies, at least they had some principles, you know, and at least they had some values. And now it's just sort of say anything to win. And that's what they've devolved into. Right. Uh, and so uh, out gay representative from the Bronx, Richie Torres, has introduced the Santos Act, which stands for Stop Another Non-Truthful Office Seeker. A $100,000 fine if you lie about your education, military service, and employment history, uh, and or a one-year prison sentence. He's introduced this bill. Now, Santos went on the Steve Bannon broadcast, which podcast, which tells you everything you need to know about him. Uh, Steve was in court uh, facing uh, federal ch charges, or no, local, local charges, federal charges, whatever. Anyway, um, so he, the show was guest hosted by Matt Gates, oh, Lord. <laughs> which tells you all you need to know. And Santos said, I just pray for all of you when they come for you that you have uh, the strength that I have. <laughs> Oh my God! I mean, well, I mean, you know, the, the, the levels of delusion. I mean, you know, it, it, and like I said, it, it it becomes comical after a while. You know, he claimed to be a volleyball champion. Actually, that was his boss at Linkbridge Investors. He claimed to need double need double knee replacement because of how hard he played volleyball. He never played. Uh, you know, he claimed that he had a brain tumor. He claimed he's, he was one of the first 10 New Yorkers to get COVID. I mean, the medical miracles with this guy just don't stop. Now, uh, we told you that Matt Gates at least asked him, where'd you get all that money when you were broke, right? The $700,000 you lent to your campaign. And he said, well, I'll tell you where I didn't get it. I didn't get it from the Russians or the or the Ukraine or Ukraine or something else. And he said, well, that's, that's an answer. No, it's not. <laughs> and this week it's been discovered that he did do business with the cousin of a Russian oligarch. Uh, a go-between for Stormy Daniels. And <laughs> this is the kind of characters that he hangs out with. These are the kind of people he's appointing to his staff. Well, and as if all that toxic mendacity wasn't enough, you know, he's, he's, he's he gave an interview or an interview has been, been turned up where he, gave, he talked about don't say gay. Sorry, it's not an interview. It was a post in he, Facebook where he talked about don't say gay. And he said, as a gay man, I stand proudly behind not teaching our children sex or sexual orientation. That's incumbent on parents, not educators. DeSantis, well, you have my full-blown support, and I support your decision to protect our children's innocence. Well, let's, wow. let's, hear, let's hear from George Santos himself. He went to a forum in 2019, and catch this at the beginning, he introduced it's a gay forum to get gay people out of the Democratic Party. Cool. Yeah, we're the haters. Oh, you gotta be here. Yeah. So my name is Anthony DeVolder. Um, I'm a New York City resident. I recently founded a group called United for Trump. So if you guys want to follow, that would be awesome. My question's directed for both Blair and um, Brandon. Well, Brandon's an idol to all of us. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, but Blair, I, I have a question. How do you think that as a trans woman and a conservative, you can help educate other trans people from not having to follow the narrative that the media and the Democrats put forward? And how can Brandon incorporate that into walk away in more, more in debt? That's my question. My approach has always been to just live my life authentically, make the videos I want to make. And, you know, I don't like using the word educate because I feel like who might have yeah, I mean, that's enough. I mean, yeah. we just wanted to give you a little flavor of Anthony DeVolder, yeah. which is how he was representing himself in 2019, the year before he ran as George Santos. It's a con constant moving target with him. That's why I call him the gayish guy, alternatively known as uh, George Santos. Um, he's now been appointed to committees. He will be on the House Committee on Small Business, where no doubt his experience as a consultant to Willy Wonka on starting his chocolate factory will be useful. And he has been appointed to the Committee on Science, Space, and Technology, where he can explore the effect of Jewish space lasers, I'm sure. I'm sure that's what's on the well, top of his agenda. Look, we can only hope that he's an albatross around the neck of the party. And, and but, you know, shame on the people of Long Island uh, for this is the kind of person that they, they would elect. I mean, I mean not, just the, not just the lies, 
totally hard right, totally Trumpian. You know, Long Island was trending. You know, we were both from Long Island originally. Long Island was Republican when we were kids, but it was trending more Democrat. And then, you know, in this last election, uh, they went back to the right. And, you know, Andy, uh, a friend of mine who is a Nassau County legislator, who's a Democratic politician, and I asked her, you know, how could the Democrats let this happen? How could they not do their due diligence and get this out there? And, you know, they said that some of these irregularities were known to the voters before the election. Obviously not the depth and the extent of them, but some of them were known and they just didn't get tracked. They tried to beat him just on the fact that he was anti-abortion and pro and pro MAGA. That's why they tried to beat him. They did not uh, really go after all this stuff. The only one that did was a Republican newspaper out on Long Island, which found out all this stuff and had to do, had to endorse the Democrat. But enough on George Santos, unless you have anything more. No. Nope. Well, let's talk about the whole Congress, because we now know that the 118th Congress set a new record for LGB representation. Uh, from one out Republican, rep, excuse me, one out representative in the 99th Congress in 1986, and I guess that would have been Gary Studs of Massachusetts, to 11 uh, out representatives and two out senators. Look at the chart here. That's how much it's gone up over the years. In the House, all but one are Democrats. You know who the Republican is. And in the Senate, we now have Democrat Tammy Baldwin of Wisconsin and newly minted independent Kirsten Cinema, who is trying to survive in Arizona after alienating the Democrats who elected her. In the House, we have, and a lot of these are people who have been reelected. Um, they're not first time winners, but Richie Torres from New York, Becca Ballin from Vermont, Chris Pappas from New Hampshire, David Cicciolini from Rhode Island, um, uh, Mark Pocan from Wisconsin, Eric Sorensen from Illinois, Sharice Davis from Kansas, um, Robert Garcia from California, and my fellow Harvard grad, one class ahead of me, uh, Mark Ticano from uh, California. Great, great group. Although it's not 10% of the Congress. No. If we're, if we're 10% of the population. Exactly. So, you know, you, you know, you talked about the Republican leadership. Uh, Kevin McCarthy's majority is tenuous. Um, and I, what is it, like four people? Uh, that's why he's holding on to Santos. And Florida Representative Vern Buchanan, uh, who, was, who was the senior member on the Powerful Ways and Means Committee, was denied the chairmanship by McCarthy in favor of a more subservient McCarthy ally. So Buchanan exploded at the McCarthy staff. He used bad words. But it was it, it fueled anxiety among the Republicans that he was just going to leave the Congress and leave them with one less member out of peak, uh, reducing the majority from four to three. You know, looking back on it, you really have to give Nancy Pelosi credit because she held a fractious, very disparate group of Democrats together when they had a, a majority as slim as the Republicans have now or close to it. And she held them together. And I don't think Kevin McCarthy is going to be able to do that. Newt Gingrich, who was a horror show, said Nancy Pelosi was the greatest speaker ever. Yeah. All right. Uh, we told you about that Herschel Walker staffer who accused uh, conservative leader Matt Schlapp, chair of CPAC, uh, uh, of sexually harassing him, molesting him back in October. He, this guy, staying anonymous publicly, uh, has filed a lawsuit seeking $9.4 million in damages. Schlapp denies everything, but, you know, uh, the guy recorded all this stuff at the time, told everybody at the time, told the Walker staff at the time. Um, and he now he's claiming retaliation from Walker's wife, uh, the, the guy who's bringing the suit. Uh, and anyway, uh, she worked in the Trump White House. Uh, her name is Mercedes Schlapp or, or Mercy Schlapp. Schlapp. Uh, and on Trump's re-election re campaign. And he's, uh, Schwab is saying, has denied any improper behavior and is saying that this has caused him tremendous pain. Oh, yeah. Well, he ought to thought about that before he uh, uh, put his hand on the guy's crotch. All right. Uh, so we talk about the stuff that's going on in the states, uh, some of these uh, uh, state issues. Uh, in Texas, a school district that removed, this is a federal issue, actually, a school district that removed all LGBTQ themed books, 130 of them, from its libraries is being investigated by the U.S. Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights for violations of Title IX. 
Yeah, they're taking a really uh, innovative approach. Um, they're saying that by banning books um, by you know class of people, that that is a form of discrimination. And if they can make this legal approach stick, then it's going to be a powerful tool across the country for rolling back these really spreading and heinous attempts to eliminate everything gay from school libraries yeah. and all the other book bannings. Yeah, the ACLU had gotten the ball rolling down in Texas, and they said, look, you know, first of all, they're making a lot of false claims about the content of the books, and they're removing them anyway. They're removing books on racial identity also. Uh, and, it, you know, they're saying when you do this, it sends a message to the entire community, not just us, that LGBTQ identities are inherently obscene and worthy of discrimination. And they're depriving LGBTQ students of the opportunity to read about ourselves uh, and, and, and our own experience. And this is a nationwide problem. Absolutely. So, now, the case could, if we win it, you know, then the religious people can start saying, well, we want more religious books reflective of us. Fine, let's put everything in the library. That's what I'm in favor of. I agree 100%. It's funny, this uh, uh, researcher for a right-leaning group in Wisconsin named Will Flanders, he said, this isn't sort of the sort of civil rights issue that requires federal intervention. It's a question about books in schools, not about individual rights being violated. Well, what about the individual rights of the students who now no longer have access to books about themselves? Right. Duh. Right. Okay. And staying uh, on, on this theme at, at uh, Yeshiva, wait a minute, should we go? Yeah, let's go to Yeshiva University. We've okay. told you about this. It's a, it's a college in New York um, that uh, won't recognize its LGBTQ student group, and they're continuing to fight against it. Uh, so three state senators in New York, including our own Brad Hoylman, I think we have a picture of him there. There he is. Um, and Brad is openly gay. Yes, are now saying, well, you know, you got $230 million in public funds to renovate your facilities under a, a, a state bond act, you know, but, you know, you represented yourself as a, as just an educational institution, not as a religious institution. And now so this, they're, this, they're this, saying you may have committed fraud in that case. And the reason why this matters so much is because of the long history that Yeshiva U has with uh, the a student group that has attempted to form an LGBTQ club. And when they were confronted with this, they said, oh, no, we don't have to recognize the club because we're actually a religious institution. So they're claiming religious institution when it suits them, but then secular institution when they want the money. So which is it? And this is, this is uh, potentially going to go all the way to the Supreme Court. Um, and if it does, you know, our chances of winning, it's hard to say because... Well, that, that's the problem. I mean, the court seems to be willing to give the religious groups their cake and let them eat it too. You know, yeah. I mean, yeah. you could, they, could, they can play by a different set of rules. No comply. I mean, look, I mean, we've also talked about the fact that a lot of these uh, uh, ultra-Orthodox schools, this is not... Uh, uh, yeshiva, uh, but the, they're not even meeting state educational standards and the state isn't doing anything about it. Uh, yeah. And that's in New York. So anyway, uh, separate the church and state. Uh, by the way, the new governor of Arkansas, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, oh man, uh, she's on the war path uh, in the same way against all these books and on race and uh, sexual orientation and everything. But so continuing uh, on the theme of, you know, religious exemptions and religious entitlements um, in Michigan, uh, or sorry, uh, in Maryland, um, there's a Catholic hospital, um, or it used to be a Catholic hospital, but it became part of the University of Maryland system. And when they did that, they decided that they weren't going to give uh, affirming care to a transgender man, Jesse Hammonds, who was scheduled to have a hysterectomy. Um, so they claimed, well, you know, there's a covenant. When our formerly Catholic hospital was bought by the University of Maryland and incorporated into their system, there was a covenant that said we had to follow all the Catholic policies that were in place beforehand. But on the other hand, when it became part of the University of Maryland, it became a state institution that is subject to constitutional non-discrimination requirements and the Affordable Care Act, which says you can't discriminate. So those two things have collided, and uh, Jesse Hammonds uh, sued 
to, to say, hey, you know what? This was wrong that I had to go to another hospital to get my hysterectomy. Now, it's a, it's a subtle legal issue in this case. Uh, the hospital receives federal funds, and they still call themselves a Catholic hospital within the University of Maryland. Uh, but when you, when you receive the federal funds, that's an agreement to waive sovereign immunity from ACA claims. So the, the judge in this case was a Clinton uh, appointee. Uh, the University of Maryland is trying to claim, oh, you know, uh, we're still committed to meeting the needs of transgender patients. But no, if you send them away to another place, you're not. Exactly. And to clarify what you meant by sovereign immunity, that's the principle that um, states can't be sued by the federal government. And they're saying, because this is now a state hospital, we can't be sued by the federal government. Right. But when you sign on to the ACA, you give that up. So it, it's, it's, there are lots of really complicated legal wrangling involved in this whole case. Exactly. But you're right that in the end, we're up against the United States Supreme Court, and that's going to be a problem. Yep. Unless we reform the court, which we don't seem to be moving in any uh, such direction. All right, in Missouri, in Stockton, uh, the abusive Christian residential facility, we've told you about this, Agape Boarding School um, was shut down January 20th, uh, shutting down January 20th, and they're saying the closure is voluntary, but dozens of former students have gone public with stories of physical, mental, and sexual abuse in the last few, few years, uh, or at least the, they reported it in the last few years. There are numerous lawsuits pending uh, the census at the facility for boys was down to 25 from 121 in early 2021. Uh, the Missouri Attorney General filed an injunction seeking to close it in September. And so, it sounds like they don't have the funds to continue anyway. They used to have a budget of four million per year, and that's down to 400,000. And then the, the, the current director said, I'm not sure it's even that. Yeah, I don't know why anybody would send their kids there or courts would send their kids there. And, they, you know, they're obviously not keeping keeping track of it. OK, then Oregon. Uh, there was a suit brought. We told you about it uh, by a group calling themselves the Religious Exemption Accountability Project, saying that a lot of these religious schools get all kinds of federal money and they're discriminated against their LGBTQ students. And but a federal judge, uh, but dismissed their suit. Um, they sued the religious schools, uh, saying that the discrimination they were discriminated against students besides, besides despite receiving federal funds. And they cited the Bostock decision, which says such discrimination in employment is illegal. Um, a, but a Clinton judge, Ann Aiken, said they lack standing to assert their claim under the Administrative Procedures Act, whatever that is and said that the Supreme Court has upheld these religious exemptions. This is another complicated you know, decision made on some obscure legal basis. And it's really hard to parse how all of this is going to shake out at the Supreme Court level, because it has the potential to impact a lot of things and have a lot of uh, to, to open the door to a lot of discrimination on a lot of levels, not just against us. Well, even the Obama administration granted a lot of these waivers to these religious schools, uh, you know, to go ahead and engage in this kind of activity. In the old days, when we were kids, you know, Bob Jones University was told, if you're not going to let the people of different races date each other, you can't get federal funds. You know, it's just like that. You could do it, but and you, you're a private religious group. And you can do it, but you uh, you can't then then say, well, we want federal funds to support our bigotry. And the way the federal the the Supreme Court is going now, it's hard to imagine how a ruling like that could be consistently upheld when they're giving all these exemptions. Right. Well, I I mean, Brown v. Board of Education could be at peril. All right. Um, let's go to some other state news. Uh, in uh, Now, you did talk about Wisconsin, didn't you? That the state licensing board there uh, is uh, uh, once again banning uh, uh, conversion therapy? Uh, did not. No. OK. Uh, the vote was along party lines in the state legislature. You know, 20 states in the District of Columbia banned the practice. Governor Tony Evers, you know, does it by executive order, and then the state, with and well through the state licensing board, and then the Republican legislature, which has a veto-proof majority, overrules him. All right, should we get to the news of drag queens? 
Yes, let's do that. Um, we have, for example, right here in New York, and I say here in New York, I'm actually in California right now, but in New York and in my grandmother's old neighborhood, which infuriates that this is happening there. Um, Jackson Heights? They, uh, East Elmhurst. Right. Yeah, so right next door to Jackson Heights. It's all part of, part of the same uh, neighborhood. But uh, they've been attacking the drag queens, the, the drag story hours in libraries in Jackson Heights and East Elmhurst, they being the usual suspects, the, the proud boy types. Um, and, but happily, the, the city council member there, um, um, and I hope I pronounce uh, his name correctly, Shekhar Krishnan, yeah. has been standing up for the community. And as a result, on Martin Luther King Jr. Day, um, he got those proud boy types outside his house protesting. Second time they've done that outside his home. They've done it four other times at, at the libraries um, and, and uh, district offices um, where uh, Drag Story Hour has, has occurred. So that was really difficult, but he's not budging. He, he is saying, you know, uh, let these protesters come. I, they're not going to budge me. Um, and especially on a day like today, this is meaningful. And we are going to stand by LGBTQ rights. Jackson Heights and what's the other neighborhood you said? Uh, Elmhurst in East Elmhurst. Elmhurst. This is the most diverse neighborhood in the world. I this is the neighborhood that's on the seven train that they always talk about. You ride the seven train from one end to the other and you're basically taking an international tour of the globe. I'm, you know, you can you can just walk a few blocks there, and you're in completely different countries. It's it is it's an absolutely wonderful uh, neighborhood. Uh, was represented by an out gay man, uh, Danny Drum, who was term limited, an old friend of ours, uh, and succeeded by this guy uh, uh, Shakar Krishnan. So yes, uh, if you're going to represent that area, you're going to be standing up for LGBTQ rights and the rights of all. In fact, uh, the Central Plaza in Jackson Heights is called Diversity Plaza. <laughs> you know, so they're into it out there, and and so much the better. Well, meanwhile, in Baltimore, Maryland, uh, protesters have uh, taken kind of the approach we used to see when people when. Um, the uh, what was the the Westboro Baptist Church would go to the funerals of people who had died of AIDS and or, scream, or Matthew Shepard yeah yes and scream horrible things and and people would show up with giant uh, angel wings to block them well similarly in Baltimore when uh, the haters are showing up uh, at Drag Story Hour they are creating a rainbow wall to block um, the attendees and protect them uh, from the abuse and so they can have uh, their kids enjoy uh, a happy story time, which is what it's supposed to be. Yeah, I wish we had pictures of it. I, uh, uh, this is the Canton Live branch of the library in Baltimore, and 80 people attended the, the drag, drag Queen Story Hour at a church across the street from the library, and they needed a bigger space. Two dozen protesters showed up, 70 counter-protesters from our side who held up umbrellas, flags, sheets to block the uh, anti-LGBTQ signs while playing Disney music and Broadway tunes <laughs> and chanting, leave our children alone and let our kids be kids. Megan McCorkle, who's a spokesperson for the library system, said, we've been organizing Drag Queen Story Hour for the past three years and never had protests. I have no idea what caused this. Well, I, I can tell you, social media is what caused it. Because of it's because of that damn internet. Uh, this has become a thing for the what's called the libs of TikTok. They alert people all over the country and they say go. And there's a handful of people who will go anywhere when this happens, just like the Westboro Baptist Church. I mean, the Westboro Baptist Church only had about 50 members and they did thousands of demonstrations a year. Uh, and these groups, there are there have been 124 incidents last year targeting uh, these readings in 47 states. I don't know what the ones that didn't get hit were, but uh, that, it's just become a thing. And you know, some of these people stand there in, in total indignation, like you're harming our children. I mean, they, they don't have any idea what's going on. Well, but to link this back to George Santos, uh, which may seem odd, but it's part of that whole you know, new right-wing approach of say anything to win. Say, oh, drag queens are groomers. Say it enough time and enough rubes will believe you that, you know, they'll get out there and they'll protest and you'll score political points and you'll go further in the political system. 
it, it's well, just that say anything mentality. Well, Arkansas is is introducing a bill to classify drag shows as a adult entertainment. Now, you know, sometimes it is, but uh, uh, when you just get dressed up to read it, I mean, what about when a clown gets dressed up? What's that? I mean, that's a kind of drag. I mean, quite frankly, what I'm wearing is drag. It's male drag, you know, uh, whatever. Uh, seriously, and I mean that, you know, nobody, we shouldn't be judging each other on, on what we're wearing, uh, but that's, that's what they're doing. Well, I can't imagine for a second that a law like that would survive uh, constitutional scrutiny. Now, we told you last week about Florida, how Governor DeSantis, who, by the way, is losing in the polls to Trump by about 47 to 30 or something. I thought he was winning. Not now. For the There's a new poll that just came out today that has Trump in the lead for the Republican nomination. Now, you know, I think if Trump were the nominee, he'd be easier to beat, I think. On the other hand, if he gets elected again, I think the United States is kind of over. Uh, but uh, and that's no joke. But that's what's happening. So anyway, he's he's been stacking uh, university boards with these complete right-wing nuts. And again, this is going to alienate the students, and they're not going to want to go to these schools if they implement these policies. They'll just leave. Uh, but at, at my old alma mater, the University of Virginia, uh, the student council there called on the General Assembly in Virginia to block my Governor Youngkin's nomination of my classmate from the class of 75, Bert Ellis, a right-wing nut, um, uh, calling him a threat to marginalized students. And of course, in my day, he was just anti-gay and uh, blocked a, a co-sponsorship of, a, of a, a, a speech by Frank Kameny, the founder of the, of the gay movement back in 1975. So to be clear, Andy, you get Bert Ellis and I get Mark Ticano. You get who? I get Mark Ticano as... as uh... <laughs> We had we had some fine, uh, fine alumni of the university. Very fine alumni of the University of Virginia. Very fine. I was look. I'm grateful to Virginia. In my day, it was quite cheap. I mean, I was an out of state student, and my tuition was like seven hundred dollars a semester. You know, now it's wow. ridiculously high. It's probably up in the range of forty or fifty thousand, and all those kinds of. But in those days, they wanted out of state students to to give them a good mix of people. In-state students paid 60 bucks a semester for tuition. But, you know, our generation, or at least mine, uh, kind of let cheap tuition go by the wayside. And that's not good for the country. No, it's uh, uh, the students who come out now are saddled with so much debt, it's inconceivable. Should um, we? Go ahead. Well, no, I was going to say, should we talk about two deaths and in two very different categories? One is... Uh, uh, yes. The Catholic Cardinal Pell, and the other would be the financier. Well, uh, we'll, we'll talk about him international. Is, I, I guess one other national item we should mention is, in, I just learned that in West Hollywood, Seppi Shire was elected the mayor by her colleagues, the first time a woman of color, the first Iranian American, and the first LGBT Iranian elected anywhere in the world. She's the mayor. They rotate the mayor every year. The colleagues elect you. Uh, her priorities are improving the lives of people with disabilities and collaborating on mental health issues and public safety with L.A. County. But it's a breakthrough. So no, now, it's awesome. yes, more let's, diversity. Let's talk about, uh, uh, I have to say, I was not aware of this gentleman, um, Scott Miner. Sure. Scott Miner died at the age of 63 of a heart attack while working out. Um, he was a, uh, and I have to admit, I wasn't aware of him either, but his work sounds awesome. Uh, he built up a, a, an organization called Guggenheim Partners into an investing powerhouse on Wall Street. He was a frequent guest on Bloomberg, you know, uh, news. Um, but what really makes him stand out for us is the fact that with that sizable fortune he amassed, he was very active, apparently, as a, a philanthropist supporting LGBTQ issues, the community, other human rights efforts as well. Um, yeah, one of his philanthropists. Worked with, go ahead. No, I was I'm just, just going to say, he worked with the, the support group Smog International to create housing for LGBTQ people in Uganda. It is so definitely needed. I mean, 
folks in smug, and I hate that acronym, but the folks in smug have been under so much pressure for so long. And, you know, to get that kind of financial helping hand, I'm sure was huge for them. Right. And he joined a delegation meeting uh, with uh, asylum seekers and refugees turned away at our border through his work as a board member of the Robert F. Kennedy uh, Human Rights Group. Uh, and this is the father who's, who was slain in uh, June of 1968 when he was running for president. Uh, when he was 37, by the way, he gave up finance for bodybuilding full time. <laughs> and But he returned to finance in short order, uh, remaining a dedicated bodybuilder. But uh, Scott Minard, a very interesting character, uh, gone he is, he is, 63. He is survived by his partner, Eloy Mendez, whom he married in 2017. So uh, and together they produced a short documentary called We Are Here about undocumented immigrants under the age of 30. So they were into good stuff. Good stuff. Not into good stuff, unfortunately, was uh, Cardinal George Pell. And can we move uh, on to that? Are we ready for international news? Well, yes. Uh, you want, yeah, if you want to segue to another uh, obituary, let's go to George Pell. All right. So um, Cardinal Pell was from Australia. Uh, died at the age of 81 of heart co uh, complications from hip replacement surgery. Um, he was a hard right winger, but his downfall ultimately was the child sex abuse uh, scandals. He got hit by accusations by two um, uh, young men who said that as, uh, as youths, they were abused by him. He went to prison for it, was sentenced to six years, but that uh, conviction was vacated by the Australian courts and he- But he did spend a year in solitary before they overturned his conviction. Yes, and so he, but he did eventually uh, get out. He was a hardliner at the Vatican. He, one of the things, he was head of, uh, or uh, put in charge of their uh, finances, um, namely because he was creative in methods to protect the church from being bankrupted by cases involving claims of abuse. Right. So he had a long history of really um, unfortunate, shall we say, comments about gay people and homosexuality. Um, I, you know, I can run through them here, but you know, God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, and important consequences follow from this, Cardinal Pell said in 2002. And what we just learned today uh, was that he was the author of an anonymous memo that was circulating in Rome, because he was back there, uh, and uh, which said, here's how you here's how you get rid of uh, get a pope after Francis that's going to return the church to the straight and narrow and you know, and against everything that Francis stood for. And yet, I saw a picture of it. Francis presided over Pell's funeral at the Vatican. So uh, you know he was covering up sex abuse and all those all those kinds of things. But let's give them some better news. Uh, and a lot of this is late breaking. Um, first of all, the Dutch. Senate approved a constitutional amendment banning discrimination based on sexual orientation and disability. Uh, this is an historic breakthrough. We're not on the Constitution in very many places. We're in South Africa and uh, there's hardly any others. Uh, in 2001, uh, this was the first country to legalize same-sex marriage, but the vote on this amendment was 56 to 15. And speaking of South Africa, um, the government there is set to decriminal, decriminalize sex work to combat HIV and crime against women. So progress there. The other country that has a constitutional protection of sexual orientation, non-discrimination in its constitution. Right. Um, apparently, there has been a growing wave of violence against women in South Africa. Um, up to 10,000 rapes were reported, uh, um, which is up 11%. Uh, um, and uh, they have the largest HIV caseload in the world. So by decriminalizing sex work, they're hoping to, to fight both of those scourges in their society. Right. I mean, you know, you, you mentioned, you know, this is, a, this is a third real issue for a lot of people, uh, decriminalizing sex work. It's, it's, we don't do it in this country, except in what, Nevada, uh, and, and only in certain parts. Uh, at the at the hearing on the chief for the chief judge of New York, one of the Republican judges said, "Well, you were endorsed by the Working Families Party, and they want to decriminalize sex work. Uh, where do you stand on that?" And he, he didn't want to talk about it, but of God, we certainly have to confront it. But we also had a, a terrific sweeping decision from the European Court of Human Rights. We've got a couple of decisions there to talk about. This is a Russian case 
they ruled that member states, including Russia, are obligated to recognize same-sex partnerships. The Russians have, of course, refusing to. Um, this ruling doesn't require them to do same-sex marriage, but you have to develop a legal framework for recognition of same-sex couples. So there are six member states that have no recognition. Bulgaria, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Romania, and Slovakia. And then there's the Polish case. Yes. Um, in Poland, the EU, EU court issued a ruling that upheld um, a, a man's right for, for employment. In other words, a non-discrimination ruling. There he is, Jakub Kwasinski, with his husband there. I'm so glad you said that instead of me, because I looked at the spelling. I, and I like, wrote it out. Ja Jakub Kwasinski. Yeah, with his, uh, with his husband, David Majcek. And uh, basically, he was working for a, a television broadcaster, state broadcaster in Poland. And he had worked there as a freelance audiovisual editor since 2010. And then in 2017, suddenly, no more work no more job, happened to coincide just by accident. Two days after, he and his husband, uh, who run a popular YouTube channel, had published a music video titled Love Us at Christmas, in which they highlighted homophobic rhetoric and called for tolerance of LGBT people. And suddenly, two days later, no more work. So well, these guys were married in Portugal. They want their marriage recognized. So this ruling affects not just LGBTQ people, but also freelancers and bringing cases. The other big international news this week is, you know, Scotland's parliament uh, passed the Gender Recognition Reform Act, which makes it easier to change your gender. Uh, you can do it at a younger age, 16 instead of 18. So in, in, for the first time since power was devolved to the Scottish parliament, the UK parliament is stepping in, not the parliament, but the, but the, the administration is stepping in, invoking some clause and saying, you can't do this. So this is creating a constitutional crisis. This could push Scotland into independence because even conservatives in Scotland, a lot of them voted for this, this law and they're saying, you're not gonna tell us what to do. And, uh, and, and I, I hate to say it, but even the labor leader, Keir Starmer, had, had a lot of hesitation about letting Scotland go ahead with this uh, reform act. It's quite remarkable that our issues could be the, the focal point that causes Great Britain to break apart, finally. They're fighting over us, they've always fought over us. Um, and the, the rationale that the conservative UK administration offered for invalidating the Scottish Parliament's law is that they felt it, it created um, inequities, inequalities in the treatment of people across the UK, to which I say, if that's the case, then liberalize laws throughout the UK so that they're the same. Exactly. So that everybody has the, the right uh, to, to change you know, their gender. Transgender issues became a hot button issue in the campaign for the leader of the Tory party. And they tried to outdo themselves, you know, saying, oh no, women are women, trans people are something else, blah, 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 blah. But, They've, you know, the conservative government once made a commitment, we're going to get rid of conversion therapy. Then they said under Boris Johnson, no, we're not going to do it for trans. Today, in, in, in reference to this other bad decision, they're saying, okay, we'll do, we'll ban conversion therapy for, our, for LGBTQ. You know, you know, we, we can't do it anymore. That's, this is, they just, but uh, hold, you know, hold on to your seats. Uh, that's not a final decision. Wow. Right, um, going right. down to Kenya, we have more um, information on the LGBTQ activist whose body was found in a trunk. Um, the, uh, the name of the activist is Edwin Chiloba, a 25-year-old, sorry, 25-year-old designer and model. And um, apparently he was smothered and it looks like it was likely a case of uh, domestic violence. Five yeah, people now, I not, believe. He, been... was, he was basically asphyxiated by be, being put into a metal box. Originally they said they gouged his eye out, they beat the crap out of him. But I mean, that's apparent. The police, at least, are saying that's not the case. Uh, this guy was disowned by his family. Uh, his, his sister called him a devil for being gay. And now another relative is saying, don't say he was gay. He was a, he was a good pastor. He was a good Christian. Because this is a Christian country, by the way, Kenya. Uh, but it's a, it's a very sad story all along. Uh, the ex-partner has been arrested. Jack, uh, what's his name? Jackton Odhiambo, uh, also in his mid-20s. 
and uh, five other people were arrested in this case. All right, in Romania, a same-sex marriage uh, and civil unions are not recognized, uh, but uh, Evie, a trans woman, has uh, identity papers that uh, class her as a male. So she could marry her woman partner. So she shows up and they said, go get dressed up and according to the identity in your papers. But she refused. Uh, there was more resistance on the wedding day, but they eventually got married, but it left them wanting to leave the country. My grandparents yeah, uh, too. Oh, uh, 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 is your ancestry Romanian, Andy? I thought no, you were in Hungarian. They're German, but it was a German town in Eastern Europe uh, yeah. that's not there anymore. Yeah. There was something called World War II. The Germans were very mean, uh, and uh, the German towns sort of don't exist anymore. All right, in India, this is a, the, the ruling Hindu party uh, is hostile to Muslims, but the leader of the parent organization has come out in support of LGBTQ rights days before the Modi government is due to respond to the Supreme Court about petitions to legalize same-sex marriage. This guy's a biggie in the, in, the par, in the party, Mohan Bhagwat, and he cited Hindu scriptures and mythology as the basis of his support. Awesome. Yeah, I hope it holds. All right, uh, what else have we got? Um, okay, uh, well, Hong Kong, the high court heard the challenge to the laws uh, around public restrooms and trans people. We'll give you that when they make a decision. Um, what else? We got to get to your. We got to get to your stuff here. Let's. Yeah, go. Well, well, just really quickly, there's some AIDS and health news we should uh, um, yes. mention. Uh, something Anne passed on to us, which is unfortunate. Um, an, investi invest yeah, an investigational vaccine uh, that was safe and tolerated was not showing any efficacy um, against HIV. Um, so they've pulled the plug on those uh, trials um, and it underscores the challenges that have faced the global community in the search for an HIV vaccine. Also in health news, uh, supply chain issues are creating shortages of testosterone around the world, especially in Mexico, but, but all over the world. Uh, we have shortages here in some cases. And one of these trans men said, when I, when I can't get my, you know, my, my, my dosage, it's as if knives are stabbing into my stomach and it can lead to loss of bone calcium. So they're all networking with each other to try to get the drugs. And I have attention to heterosexuals here. You accounted for 22% of new HIV infections and data released from 2020, but fewer than 1% of you are using PrEP and only 32% even know about it. So the CDC uh, found that many doctors don't recommend PrEP to straight people because they see it as a gay medication. Uh, so, And you know, when you see the ads on TV, they always show gay people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, uh, Golden Globes? Golden Globes, I did not watch. I didn't either, I saw a few minutes of it. They tried to rehabilitate themselves after being exposed for lack of diversity, zero black members. Uh, being boycotted a bunch. But anyway, the out gay host was Gerard Carmichael. And what I got to see was that he did a terrible job, although his first line was pretty funny. I'm here because I'm black. <laughs> Which was true. But he kind of made a homophobic joke during it. I don't want to get into it. Uh, but I'm glad he, that he got a half a million, at least he got a half a million dollars for the gig, which is a lot less, though, than they paid Ricky Gervais. And then uh, the big honoree with the Carol Burnett Award was out gay producer Ryan Murphy. Glee, feud, pose. Um, he was introduced by Billy Porter, who said, who said pose was turned down 162 times until Ryan said yes. Murphy paid tribute to LGBTQ actors there. Uh, Billy Porter, Nicey Nash, <coughs> Matt Bomer, Michaela uh, uh, J. Rodriguez, and Jeremy Pope. And he said his goal was to take the invisible, the unloved, and make them all heroes. I longed to, longed to see, but never did in pop culture. Although, of course, this is also the guy who produced Dahmer and uh, the Andrew Cunanan story. So, you know, I don't know what's supposed to say. Anyway, uh, not too much in terms of gay winnings. Uh, Kate Blanchett uh, plays a predatory lesbian in, in Tar, and she keeps winning. And she also won the Critics' Choice Award, as did Brendan Fraser for playing a, a morbidly obese gay man in the well. Now, Chris Cooper, you've got a book coming out, Extraordinary Birder. Uh, tell us. Oh, no, no, the book is uh, Better Living Through Birding. Oh, That's sorry, the book. I'm sorry. I'm That's sorry. okay. 
my notes. There's there the book, Better Living Through Birding, Notes from a Black Man in the Natural World. It's a memoir. And so it's, uh, uh, yeah, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, writing memoir I found incredibly difficult. It's like taking off your clothes in public. Um, and in fact, there is an episode where I take off my clothes in public in the book. You'll have to read the book to find out the circumstances, how and when that happened. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, I basically just sort of tried to communicate um, how birding has been sort of laced through my life, but also it goes a lot into, you know, growing up gay, oh. out, out gay, and as a kid, you know, closeted gay uh, all through high school, and how, uh, you know, that kind of shaped my life and my perspectives. Right. So, and, and this is uh, due out when? It comes out on June 13th. And we will give you the link if, uh, uh, to if you want to learn more about it in our email. Go to gayusatv.org for that. All right. So I, I, what I was referring to at first was the television series by National Geographic, Extraordinary Birder. Tell us about that. So I have the extraordinary privilege of being able to go around the country looking at birds as a job now, which is fabulous. It's a six episodes, a six episode season. And we go to New York, we go to Washington, D.C., we go to here in California, we go to Puerto Rico, Hawaii, and most significantly for me, Alabama, because I'm like, the Deep South, I don't want to go there, but we went. And it was fascinating and interesting and a collision of civil rights history and birding, if you can imagine that. So um, it's a real interesting show. We just basically put it out there that birding is for everybody and it will change your life. It and at first, it's going to, first, it's going to be on National Geographic, and then it's going to be added to Disney+. Plus. And I should say about your book, Salon.com did a feature that put it on a list of 22 books uh, they're looking forward to this year. Which was really okay. kind. Thank you, Salon. Okay. So now you're going to give us you, – you were at the – was it the Palm Springs? Uh, yes, I was at the Palm Springs International Film Festival. And let me just put in front of me my, my uh, crib sheet on my reviews. Hang on one second. And um, yeah, the first movie I saw or I want to talk about is The Blue Caftan from Morocco. It was exquisite. It was the best thing I saw on the festival. It immersed you very sort of completely in a different culture. It tells its story almost entirely through detail, slow, exquisite immersion in what's happening rather than in any other way of telling you what's happening. Um, and it's, it's, uh, and, and it is gay. It, it is gay in a way that you don't expect and it's lovely. So I highly recommend the blue caftan if you get to see that. Blue caftan. And the then, blue caftan. That's then we from got a Argentina. Yes, uh, Sublime from Argentina is a touching uh, gay coming of age tale. That horrible situation so many of us lived through when we're young, where we fall in love with our straight friend. And oh God, it just, they captured a lot of that agony. Not all of it, but a lot of it. And um, they spend a little too much time with the kid playing in his band, but otherwise it's really touching. Um, I, was lucky, was, I was lucky to have uh, uh, two two close friends who turned out to be gay. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, we didn't. I don't know how much I pined, but you know, there they were. And we had, had provided some support once we finally came out to each other. But that was in high school. Well, and this, well, it, you know, just like right around Stonewall. That's fantastic. I, I went through the falling in love with a straight friend in college, and the experience was so painful. I just kind of developed this, this circuit in the back of my brain that, you know, if I'm falling for somebody and then I find out they're, sh they're straight, the circuit trips, and I'm not, I'm not interested anymore because I'm like, I'm not going through that again. Right. Okay. Anyway. Now, huh? now, now we got a film from Germany. Yes. It's called uh, Eismeyer, um, and it's about a closeted gay drill sergeant in the German military who uh, suddenly is confronted with an openly gay very attractive member of his squad who he has to train. It's soapy and it's steamy a little bit, but it is actually based on a true story, which really surprised me. So if you're looking for that kind of thing, it, it, it's a lot of fun. It's, 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 you know, it'll, it'll get the juices while I'm watching this movie. Okay. Um, and then this finally- is, This is one from the United States of America. Yes, called- with the very lengthy title of Aristotle and Dante Discover the Secrets of the Universe, which is apparently based on a very popular novel. It's a gay teen romance 
Um, and despite some flaws, and for me, the biggest flaw was that too much of it relies on narration. I am not a big fan of narr narration in movies. But despite that drawback, it actually is, is relatively, relatively successful. And it stars, uh, for example, oh, what's her name from Desperate Housewives? A uh, Latina oh. woman. Um, ah, I'm blanking on her name. Anyway. Uh, I, I, was, I was there when uh, the film The Times of Harvey Milk, the documentary, won for Best Documentary at the New York Film Critics. I was with uh, Harvey Firestein. He got up to accept the award because uh, he had narrated it. And he, he gets up and he says, this voice was made for narration. <laughs> <laughs> oh, maybe I can get Harvey Firestein to do the, the uh, audio book of my book. Uh, you well, we did the audio of his book, and of course his memoir is out. Uh, but now you're finally going to tell us in our last two minutes about a TV series that I have not seen called Severance. Yes. Now I am late. Party this has been out for a while and winning accolades. It's streaming on Apple Plus. I am not going to say much about why you should watch it as a gay person because I don't want to spoil the wonderfulness of it. I want you to just go check it out. It is worth watching regardless of any sort of gay aspect that may be there. But wow, I was watching it and I, I thought to myself, this is not the kind of gay matter that you will see very often in anything else. And what's it basically about? It's fascinating. The setup is that a workplace is developed where they can split your consciousness that you use at work from your consciousness in the rest of your life. And what are the implications of that? That's the setup. It is fascinating. They immerse you in this world. They throw you right into that situation. You have no idea what's going on and you're slowly learning it and figuring it out. And then in all of the process of figuring this out, something gay happens, something gay, something gay that you will rarely see on TV and it's fabulous. Now you young people can understand it. Do you think we uh, elderly people can? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Well, Chris, you know, we've, we're down to our last minute. I, I just as before we before we uh, break. Oh, so congratulations on the book, the TV series. Thanks for the movie reviews and the political analysis. But, you know, just your, your last minute. How are you feeling these days about the state of the country? Well, you know, I try to stay hopeful. Um, it, and the results of the midterms were actually so much better than everyone was predicting. So there is reason for hope. But more than hope, there's reason to work, to get the work done on the ground, canvassing and, and writing letters and, and just making sure that, that our side turns out when the elections come. Yes. That's what we certainly encourage you to do. Uh, look, we fell down on the job here in New York and we lost a bunch of seats. So, uh, you know, everybody's got to get to work. Nobody's exempt from this. To and George Santos, we lost a seat. <laughs> no, It's shocking. Uh, thanks for everybody for being with us. Uh, sign up for our email at gayusatv.org. Thank you, Chris. My pleasure, Andy. And we'll be back next week. With uh, Andy, I think.